very interesting uh, for me. Typically, I was spending most of my time in British literature before 1800. Uh, I am doing a short story class in modern British lit literature right now, and we actually did a little experiment because of some interest in uh, Woodhouse and pedagogy uh, and bringing Woodhouse into that classroom, uh, which Abby came and facilitated the class discussion for that. Uh, and, and that was very instructive uh, in a number of ways and, and a lot of fun. Uh, I think, uh, Elena, you're the only one here is in the class, but it was kind of a breather because we had just done Virginia Woolf uh, and James Joyce. Thank and so it was like, oh, you know, that lighten up. <laughs> wow. uh, well, Abby is going to focus uh, her presentation on Woodhouse, which, which really became the focus of the project. I want to say that we did spend a lot of time, especially in the fall, talking about larger questions. Uh, you know, basic questions like, what is funny? And what <laughs> makes it funny, right? Why is it funny? Um, and the question of, can we do serious analysis on something that's funny? I mean, would that ruin what's funny if we took it so seriously that we started to break it down to, to figure out just exactly what makes it funny uh, or why it's funny? Uh, we talk a, a great deal about the kinds of humor that there are uh, and you know how humor works in different situations, uh, particularly the probably the, the favorite mode of satire in literary study, in courses of literary study, is satire. Right? Because satire is doing some kind of moral work. It's doing something analytical as it is. So it's easy to analyze an analytical humor like satire. Uh, on the other hand, what do you do with someone like Woodhouse, who is not really doing satire, uh, and it's much more benign? How, how are we going to uh, talk about that? Um, and so that, that took us into the questions of pedagogy. Well, you know, why do we include, and, and the larger question of canon. Right? What's in the canon? Who's in the canon? Why are they in the canon? And I think that was sort of the, the first question that started all of this for Abby was, why isn't Woodhouse in the canon? He's fabulous. He's wonderful. He's a great storyteller. And yet, he's not listed in courses. He's typically not anthologized. I did find an anthology that included Woodhouse. Um, but typically not in your Norton or your Longman anthology. Uh, so that question of canon and what belongs and what doesn't belong was also a question uh, that we talked about in relation to kinds of humor and why Woodhouse, uh, who was not only successful in terms of, you know, you, I'm sure most of you know Abby much better than I do. I, 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 I did learn, only having had her for a couple of classes in her sophomore year, uh, that there's a real sense of humor here, uh, you know, and there were a lot of moments of, of laughter, and particularly at, at Woodhouse. Um, but this, uh, you know, question of, of, of bringing Woodhouse in a favorite author, why, why wouldn't someone as skillful as this, who appeals not only to Abby, but Woodhouse has been extremely successful, right? He has a BBC television series, series based on his characters. Uh, he has sold well. Uh, over time and enduring, not just in his moment, but uh, uh, and, and so his success, you know, in many ways identifies uh, the necessity of the question: Why should we read Woodhouse? Or it could have been: Why shouldn't we read Woodhouse? Right? Something like that. So uh, I, I, I hope you'll give a welcome to Abby as she comes to talk about. Why can't Woodhouse be studied? Um, 
And there's kind of a, an assumption behind that question that is that, or behind my question of I wish that I could get credit for it, is that I can't because Woodhouse isn't something that uh, that you can study in an English literature class. The kind of writing that he does isn't something that you can study. So that assumption is what I return to to write my paper on for uh, Lit Sem class. Um, lit Crit. Lit Crit, that's it. <laughs> so, <laughs> keep saying Lit Sem, Lit Crit. Um, and so the question that came out of that assumption was why is there an assumption that Woodhouse can't be studied? Um, all the readers that I've encountered that are familiar with Woodhouse gush about his writing style, and a quick perusal of the accolades on the back cover or inside cover of any of Woodhouse's novels show that many critics have the same opinion. He's a marvelous writer. So the absence of Woodhouse from any of my English classes except in high school, my mom did a homeschool curriculum and put Woodhouse in there because she likes it too. <laughs> but other than that, he hasn't been in there. Um, if an author is generally considered to be excellent at what they do, why should they join the ranks of other proven authors common to a canon of study like Shakespeare or Twain or Austin or Wilde? So this was the fundamental question that was at the starting point of my research. In order to find out exactly what Woodhouse had to offer to readers from an academic standpoint, I took the advantage of the opportunity Dr. Smith gave me to lead a discussion on one of Woodhouse's short stories, Common Bingo, in um, the Modern British Literature course. Um, Woodhouse published stories from the 1920s up until his death in 1975. He had an unfinished work um, that he was writing at the time of his death. Um, so he was contemporary to many of the authors in the class, so he fit in very well. Um, and the discussion brought up both positive aspects of Woodhouse's writing, as well as some of the potential problems he might face in the classroom. Um, for example, one of the unique merits of Woodhouse um, and humor that came up in our discussion of Common Bigger was the restorative, restorative nature of humor. The students remarked on how much they enjoyed having a bit of a break in their assigned work with a piece of writing that they can enjoy thoroughly on a first read through. And I know you're probably thinking, well, uh, why, why is that so great? Like anybody can read a little book club on bestseller and say, yeah, we enjoyed it on a first read through. Woohoo. <laughs> um, so, that might not seem like something big, but paired with our examination of Woodhouse's mastery of language and the that gave us, that appreciation on being able to enjoy him thoroughly on first read through led us into a conversation about the importance of res restoration as a part of life and the role benign humor like Woodhouse's plays in daily experience. Obviously, every class discussion is going to be different, but I think one way of incorporating Woodhouse into the classroom is to use him as a springboard into conversation about genre, about canon, about life, as well as an exam examination of masterfully constructed prose. Um, I'm not suggesting that educators can't do this with non humorous texts. We all know we can do it with that. But I'm just suggesting that Woodhouse can bring these topics up in a similar way, but sometimes in a, in a way that's refreshing and new um, to the reader. Um, so a close examination of Woodhouse's work and his skill on an author, as an author, will help to shed lights on the merits of his writing and give readers a new appreciation for the work of this academically overlooked British humorist. Mm -hmm. um, to begin, I think I'd like to look a little bit at the criteria we use for determining whether a text is worth studying to see if Woodhouse measures up. So obviously this could be a book length response, and there has been many book length responses. So I'm going to focus on two main elements that we tend to evaluate texts by. Um, the first, um, as critic Mark Edmondson discusses in Why Read, is that we read literature for the purpose of well, learning to live our lives well. Or put more strongly, studying literature deals with the, with the quote, crafting of souls. Edmondson speaks for many critics and scholars when he aligns literature with this almost sacred purpose. In his view, quote, every major work of intellectual, intellect and imagination presents an appeal to the reader to change their life in some way. These texts hold a mirror up to society and ask it to look at itself or examine more closely something that it has previously ignored or overlooked. Edmondson also bemoans the trend he notes in higher academics lately of straying from a focus on this essential, challenging part of literature um, and instead focusing on the idea of helping students enjoy what they're reading. In 
Evans's view, nowadays class studying Shakespeare focused more attention on finding the spoonful of sugar to help the medicine of the 16th century playwright go down and less about the remedies Shakespeare might be offering. So with this criteria in mind, what makes a piece of, of, what makes a piece of literature worth studying? Where can we say humor falls? Beginning with Edmondson's idea, we may encounter a problem. The purpose of the type of humor that Woodhouse writes has a principal aim, to be funny and to make the reader laugh. In short, enjoyment stands out as, the, as its most obvious and observable purpose its medicine is as painful should. So is it permissible to study texts that we enjoy and don't immediately identify as possible candidates for the craft of the souls? Because Woodhouse focuses on humor, does this mean that he has nothing to offer us as readers in relation to serious issues? It is true that as a general rule, Woodhouse presents the image of an idyllic in England largely free from any deep concerns to address. If any potentially serious issues surface throughout the course of his stories, he gives them a light dusting of benign humor that makes us laugh, but does not particularly put them in a negative light the way a satirical approach would. Take, for instance, this famous passage from Um, from Woodhouse's uh, short story, Buried Treasure. The situation in Germany had come up for discussion in the bar parlor of the Angler's Rest. Hitler was standing at the crossroads and would soon be compelled to do something definite. His present policy, said Whiskey and Splash, was mere shilly-shallying. He'll have to let it grow or shave it off, said the Whiskey and Slim Splash. He can't go on sitting on the fence like Either a man has a mustache or he has not. There can be no middle course. <laughs> this quote illustrates Woodhouse's approach to problematic issues rather well. Woodhouse pokes fun at Hitler as a person and his facial hair arrangement, but says little about his political or ethical actions. Potentially serious issues enter Woodhouse text not to be commented thoughtfully upon, but to serve as vessels for humor. The question then still stands, are texts that don't seem to actively seek to improve society or at least say something insightful about it worthy of study? I would argue that Woodhouse may not fit into the category of texts that do this sort of thing, <coughs> but his writing still offers soul-shaping experiences to the reader. One of the strongest evidences of this is a permeation of an attitude of humility throughout his work. Part of this comes simply from the fact that Woodhouse is writing humor. And as a rule, humor has a tendency to make low things high and high things low, humbling people, objects, or ideas. Satire works in this way as does sarcasm. However, using these types of humor does not necessitate humility in the laugher or the person employing the humor. In fact, the assumption behind both satire and sarcasm, I think, is that the laugher knows better than those they are laughing at, uh, that, that they're satirizing. But this is the opposite of the attitude of the benign humor of Woodhouse where laughter is caused by the world and the laughter is included in it. Kind of from the ways in a little bit. Perhaps the best example of this in Woodhouse is the master-servant relationship of Bertie and Jeeves. Jeeves, the manservant, is the one who holds the reins in the household he shares with his employer, Bertrand Wilberforce Worcester, who, though an Oxford-educated upperclassman, can often be a bit of an idiot. The expected roles become reversed, a moment of literary clowning. That this topsy-turvy treatment of to social relationships is something Woodhouse employs often throughout his novels. Yet the most interesting thing about this relationship is the reaction of the party who is being humiliated through it. Bertie, with his many foibles, has a delightful humble streak that I would argue gives a positive experience for the reader, the freedom of acknowledging one's inability and, like Bertie, being perfectly fine with it. Take, for instance, the short story Jeeves exerts the old cerebellum. Well, Bertie has an exchange with his friend Bingo, who asks him for advice, only to specify that Jeeves' advice is really what he's after. At least, not your advice, because that wouldn't be much good to anybody. I mean, you're a pretty consummate old ass, aren't you? Not that I want to hurt your feelings, of course. Not only does Bertie refrain from getting offended at this statement, but he actually agrees quite readily with Bingo, saying, no, no, I see that. And after listening to his friend's problem, he later remarks, I wasn't in the least surprised at Bingo wanting to lug Jeeves into his private affairs like this. It was the first thing I would have thought of doing myself if I had been in any hole of any description. As I have frequently had occasion to observe, he, Jeeves, is a bird of the ripest intellect, full of bright ideas, 
anybody could fix things for Coral if you have the key code. Bertie takes it as an obvious fact that his abilities to help his friends lie far below those of Chi's, and makes sure the reader knows that this response from Bingo is not something he disagrees with. And even before this conversation in the story, Bertie has already made clear what he thinks of Chi's, and even counters a possible objection to the way he lets his butler make most of his decisions for him. When Jeeves sends back, to, back in order of mob shirts that Bertie has purchased because, quote, they would not become him, Bertie does not balk. He merely tells the reader, I thought fairly highly of those shirtings, but I bow to superior knowledge. Weak, I don't know. Most fellows, no doubt, are all for having their valets confine their activities to creasing trousers and whatnot without trying to run the home. But it's different with Jeeves. Right from the first day he came to me, I looked on him as a sort of guide, philosopher, and Bertie accepts the fact that his butler knows better than he does, and he freely admits it to both the characters in the novel and to the readers themselves. Jesus is right-hand man, and as such is elevated in Bertie's mind. He even lets the reader know when he believes other characters have treated Jesus with less respect than he deserves. For instance, in the Code of the Worcesters, Sir Watkin Bassett speaks to Jesus, calling him with, Here, you! Bertie immediately lets the reader know that this was, quote, a most improper way of addressing Jesus. Notably, while Bertie protests when his butler is addressed in this way, he allows himself to be summoned by even less polite names without winking. Aunt Dahlia, among many other titles, refers to Bertie as ugly, my gay young paper, and that young hound. And not once does he correct her for a proper address. Through this discrepancy, Bertie, albeit most likely unintentionally, creates a kind of self-deprecating humor. He will allow people to call him a tapeworm, but addressing his philosopher butler, you, goes too far. In addition to these specific examples from Woodhouse's text, the format of Jeeves and Worcester novels itself takes on a flavoring of humility. Throughout the novels and short stories, Bertie recounts for the reader his most embarrassing moments, the same stories that he worries about falling into the wrong hands when he discovers Jeeves has documented them in his butler's club's book of employer secrets. Bertie has graciously granted us access to his most humbling experiences. In some way, we become members with Jeeves of the Junior Ganymede Club, the book of humiliation held open to us for the sake of humor. Thus, the implication of Woodhouse's stories in general is that it doesn't really matter if a situation embarrasses us. If it makes us laugh, it's redeemed because laughter reflects upon and accepts our fault-filled humanity. Even though Woodhouse does not mirror, say, Twain in addressing social concerns of the time, as a humorist, he does pinpoint a more timeless truth. Life is better enjoyed with a dose of humility. The second and principal criterion I want to focus on is evidence of craft. As scholars, we're examining texts for proof that their authors are exemplary. They should have command over the language they write in and do surprising things with it, something that Woodhouse exhibits brilliantly. Good, clever humor is really heavy. It relies on the reader to make the connection between congruity and incongruity. Incongruity, or the idea that something is that shouldn't be, is a foundation of humor. Every funny moment is rooted in the audience's delightful sudden realization of the humorous subversion of what is expected. With this common background, the evaluation of well thought out humor then becomes an exercise in tracing how the humorist has used this basic element to their advantage. Woodhouse gives us an excellent example of this in the Jeeves and Worcester stories, particularly through his constant allusion to other texts within his novels. For instance, Bertie and Jeeves frequently make reference to biblical passages, Shakespeare, and many poets. In addition to including texts outside of the Jeeves and Worcester no novels, Woodhouse also often includes references within one Jeeves and Worcester novel to the stories of a previous saga within the Jeeves and Worcester universe. Thus, in order to get every joke in Jeeves, Woodhouse. It's beneficial for the reader to have a base knowledge of both the world of Bertie Worcester and English literature in general. This is not to say that Woodhouse's writing isn't funny without this prior knowledge, because his use of humorous language plays just as big a part of the success of his novels in that department. So while Woodhouse does not fail to disappoint even if the reader does not catch all these literary allusions, when we understand where his allusions come from, the congruities behind them, we can experience more fully his use of incongruity for humor's sake. However, if we set out to learn these congruities, a potential problem arises. The possibility exists that an outcome similar to that of an explained joke will result, and Woodhouse's humor will fall flat. 
The element of surprise and suddenly, suddenly real, recognizing incongruity disappears if we must teach ourselves the jokes before reading them. Consider Gertie's opening conversation with Jeeves in Jeeves in the Morning concerning a certain phrase to describe the crisis Bertie has just escaped. There's an expression on the tip of my tongue which seems to me to sum the whole thing up. Or rather, when I say an expression, I mean a say, a wheeze, a get, what I believe is called a song, something about joy and duties. Joy comes in the morning, sir. That's the baby. Not one of your things, is it? No, sir. Well, it's dashed good, he said. <laughs> Readers who have a basic knowledge of the Bible understand this joke easily. Laughter comes to the incongruity of Bertie's question with cultural assumptions about the sacred nature of scripture. The idea that Jesus has authored a passage from the book of Proverbs that has been a part of the Jewish and Christian experience for hundreds of years is ridiculous. <laughs> Without knowledge of the origins of the quote, joy cometh in the morning, the readers may still laugh at Bertie's vocabulary, a weave, a gag, but not get the cleverest nugget of the humor. Yet once we trace these missed jokes back to their originating sources, we have the opportunity to appreciate their cleverness. Although we may miss the surprise of catching the joke without learning background information, if we see thought behind the jokes, we can still delight in them, a considerably better outcome than missing them altogether. Understanding the lengths to which an author has gone to construct humor in their text allows us to both appreciate the first goal of the text, making us laugh, and its merits as a well-crafted piece of writing. Thus, this key element of incongruity creates an opportunity to develop critical thinking skills, enjoy the humorous result that makes and understand the kind of effort and techniques it takes to produce a humorous text worth studying. Not surprisingly, Woodhouse provides us an especially good example of the latter. As Alexander Coburn points out, quote, Woodhouse slaved at his props. He would fill whole notebooks with preparatory plans for a new novel. For Woodhouse, nothing in his novel should seem like filler. For quote, in a Woodhouse story, every line has to have entertainment value. He wrote and rewrote passages until everything in the novel fit together claiming in his autobiography over 70 that he might write, quote, every sentence 10 times, or in many cases, 20 <coughs> times. As Woodhouse says, quote, even if my people find my writing a dud, they will be able to say at the very least, but he did take trouble. <laughs> so where exactly do we see evidence of Woodhouse taking trouble in his novels? This attention to fashioning a well-crafted plot is evidenced by the fact that though Woodhouse reuses characters and puts them in similar situations in his stories, People continue to read his books. For instance, in any Jeeves and Worcester novel, the reader can expect Bertie to get into some kind of trouble, most likely through agreeing to do a favor for a family member or old school chum. And they can also expect that Jeeves will tidily get Bertie out of whatever scrape he's gotten himself into. It cannot be denied that the Jeeves and Worcester stories, as well as Woodhouse's other novels, have a somewhat formulaic nature. His characters behave similarly, landing themselves in the soup and somehow managing to so cleverly extricate themselves from it by the end of the novel. Apparently, at least one reader took issue with this noticeable pattern, for Woodhouse answers them in the introduction of his Blanding's, Blanding's Castle novel, Summer Lightning. A certain critic, or such men, I regret to say, do exist, made the nasty remark about my last novel that it contained all the old Woodhouse characters under different names. He has probably by now been eaten by bears, like the children who made mock of the prophet Elijah. But if he survives, he will not be able to make a similar charge against Summer Lightning. With my superior intelligence, I have outgeneraled the man this time by putting in all the old Woodhouse characters under the same names. <laughs> Pretty silly it will make him feel, I guess. <laughs> this response illustrates perfectly the reason why most readers do not take issue with the similarities between Woodhouse's skill as a writer continues to make characters interesting through sharp and witty dialogue and clever illusions. Thus, despite the predictable direction many of Woodhouse's stories take, he was still remarkably successful because his characters are so rereadable. It is not so much the what that matters in Woodhouse's plot, but the how. Though we know as soon as we begin re reading a novel about Bertie and Jeeves that it will all be sorted in the end, we still want to see the mind of Jeeves at work. To discover what exactly makes a Woodhouse plot engaging, we must look at some concrete examples from his text. While each novel's plot will differ, of course, examining particular elements of a few gives us a general idea about what types of techniques Woodhouse uses in his novel construction. 
Taking as an example any Woodhouse novel, Jews in the Morning Christmas, <coughs> the text I mentioned earlier, we notice a few interesting features. The first noticeable thing about this particular plot is its chronology. Jews in the Morning, like many Jews in Worcester novels, meets the reader just after the events of the story have taken place. Bertie greets us with the expansive opening line. After the thing was all over, when peril had ceased to loom and happy endings had been distributed in heaping handfuls, and we were driving home with our hats on the side of our heads, having shaken the dust of steeple bumpery from our tiles, tires, I confess, confess to Jeeves that there had been moments during the recent proceedings when Bertram Worcester, though no weakling, had come very near to despair. In one sentence, Woodhouse has masterfully accomplished a whole list of literary tasks. First, he has established a timeline for the reader. Bertie will be recounting events that have just recently passed. Second, they are actually in the car driving away from the scene of the crime, so to speak. So this opening conversation between the two characters is almost like a debrief of a successful mission, letting us know from the beginning how the story ends. But lest any reader decide to stop reading at this revelation, Woodhouse also puts in a teaser. Though they have just completed a mission successfully, they nevertheless encounter dark moments, as Bertie admits to his butler. Third, Woodhouse introduces the setting in which the whole story takes place, Steeple Bumpley, which seasoned Woodhouse readers will recognize as the village in which Bertie's dreaded Aunt Agatha resides. Thus, Woodhouse gives us a mini synopsis of the whole novel. Bertie encounters a sticky situation at his Aunt Agatha's home, which eventually gets resolved, but at the time, I'm often wondering if there was really any hope of avoiding big trouble. All this we receive in a mere 70 words. In one sentence, Woodhouse captures our attention with the promise of a happy ending but expertly leaves out enough information to leave us wondering of how such a neat finish came about, especially if the situation had so many near disasters as Bertie implies. As well as presenting a short rundown of the novel's story, Woodhouse also introduces his cast of characters early on, just a few lines later. We discover that this story involves Nobby Hopwood, Stilton Trueswright, Florence Cray, my uncle Percy, Jay Chistetter Clam, Edwin the Boy Scout, and old vocal in this way, Woodhouse seems to borrow a page from his experience in the theater world, presenting the reader with a sort of dramatis personae for this Jeeves and Worcester novel. Bertie even gives, gives us a title for this play, dubbing it Steeple Bumpley Horror. Woodhouse biographer Benny Green also notes the evidence of a theatrical touch in Woodhouse's work, pointing out that Woodhouse's, quote, musical career had a profound effect on everything he wrote. As Green reveals, Woodhouse was often writing musicals and novels at the same time, and Green suggests, suggests that this slow, close relationship between these two areas of expertise both expedited the problems of characterization in his fiction writing. Green quotes Woodhouse's advice to his friend William Townend about how the plot of a novel must in many ways be dictated by the characters within it. Viewing his characters as, quote, living salaried actors helps Woodhouse make careful choices about how they appear in the story. One thing, important, one thing actors, important actors I mean, won't stand is being brought in onto a play to play a scene which is of no value to them in order that they may feed some less important character. And I believe this isn't vanity, but is based on an instinctive knowledge of stagecraft. They kick because they know the balance isn't right. Therefore, for Woodhouse, a particular character might demand a change in the plot in order to be brought back on stage, as Woodhouse says. Quote, how therefore can I twist the story so as to give him more to do and keep him alive until the fall has occurred? A good example of the close re relationship between characters and plot in Woodhouse occurs in the Code of the Worcesters with the character of Roderick Spode. Code of the Worcesters is Roderick Spode's first appearance in the world of Jews and Worcester, where Bertie describes his outward appearance with the statement that it was as nature had intended to make a gorilla and had changed its mind at the last moment. I don't know if you've ever seen those pictures in the paper of dictators with tilted chins and blazing eyes, inflaming the populace with fiery words on the occasion of the opening of a new Skittle Alley. But that was what he reminded me of. We later find out that this resemblance to a dictator is not far-fetched, for Spode is the founder of a fascist organization called the Black Shorts, because their uniform includes the wearing of such, quote, perfectly foul clothing articles. According to Woodhouse's own claim that characters that have a natural major character personality have to be in the big situation of the story, it makes sense that the character with such a big presence like Spode does indeed end up being a key part of the plot. Spode's 
serves as the main villain in the novel, threatening Bertie and his friend Gussie with promises of bodily harm if they do anything to emotionally damage Gussie's one-time fiance, Madeline Bassett. Throughout the novel, Bertie and Gussie must narrowly avoid him while attempting to both find a defaming notebook that Gussie has lost and steal a cow creamer from us, Bertie's aunt, Dahlia. As keeping themselves from being pummeled becomes increasingly difficult, Jeeves comes to the rescue with a word representing a tidbit of outspoke gleaned from the book of employee secrets at the junior Ganymede, the butler's club of which Jeeves is a member. Though he does not reveal the background of the word, Jeeves instructs Bertie to mention it to Spode if ever the situation gets tight, and all shall be well. Thus, just when the game seems up for Bertie, and Spode threatens to, quote, break every bone in his body, Bertie recalls the word and tells Spode, just one minute, before you start getting above yourself, it may interest you to know that I know all about Eulalie. The word Eulalie works like a magic charm on Spode, who simmers down quickly and docilely follows Bertie's commands. This new alliance with Spode not only allows Bertie to finally procure Gussie's notebook, though it is soon out of Gussie's hands again, but also to avoid the last and potentially the most serious imbroglio of the story, being wrongfully arrested for stealing a policeman's helmet. After Jeeves uses the magic word on him, Spode himself takes the blame for the crime, leaving Bertie to depart a free man from Tottenham Towers. Later, along with Bertie, we discover the story behind Eulalie. Spode is the founder and proprietor of Eulalie Circus, a lingerie shop. While attempting to be the imposing leader of the Black Shorts, he also creates women's underclothing. Thus, Spode, the fascist fashion designer, becomes the instrument through which Jeeves ties up the situation. A memorable character leads to a memorable t t plot twist. Another area where Woodhouse's craftsmanship is especially evidenced is through his use of language. The vocabulary of Woodhouse's characters, in particular Bertie Worcester, gives his prose a distinct color. In my own experience reading Woodhouse, his character's dialogue is what keeps bringing me back to his books, and one of the biggest reasons why I can't get enough of his writing. So imagine opening a Woodhouse novel for the first time and encountering one of Bertie's delightful addresses to the reader. But half a chicken. I'm forgetting that you haven't the foggiest what all this is about. It so often times out that way when you begin a story. You whiz off the mark all pep and ginger like a meddlesome charger going into its routine, and the next thing you know, the customers are up on their hind legs, yelling for footnotes. In this small exhibition of Woodhouse's skill at creating a character's voice, we see a style that reveals the author's command of the English language. The words Woodhouse, Woodhouse uses in this passage are not foreign in their need. A reader can guess what foggiest means without having personally used the word before. The excellence of the writing lies in its surprise. Woodhouse mirrors a poet who looks for ways to make language sound in new ways. Using word pairings that the reader may not have encountered before, and ticklish metaphors like Bertie's likening here of an overzealous author whizzing off like an excited racehorse, Woodhouse catches the reader's attention with unexpected expressions. Here we see the element of surprise and incongruity working again, only this time with the expectations about something, about how something normally would be said. An expected way of stating what Bertie tells the reader might resemble something like, wait a minute, you don't know what's going on here. But in Woodhousean dialect, we must wait half a jiffy because we haven't foggy what this is all about. This surprising manner in which he constructs a phrase and pairs words together also ties to the creation of his character. Probably the biggest part of what brings Bertie to life for the reader is his distinct voice. We always recognize when he is speaking in a novel. Likewise, Jeeves has a recognizably intelligent, formal voice. When Jeeves speaks, his language's extreme difference from Bertie's voice is easily noticed. Thus, Woodhouse makes Walt's voices stand out more prominently by pairing them in dialogue. Consider this exchange between Bertie and Jeeves in Code of the Worcesters, where Bertie has just described the troublesome situation he has landed himself after agreeing to steal a cow creamer for his Aunt Dahlia. Very well, then. You agree with me that the situation is a Lulu? Certainly a somewhat sharp <coughs> crisis in your affairs would appear to have been precipitated, sir. Jeeves's translation of Bertie's language serves first to create humor. We see the incongruity of a butler speaking better than his Oxford-educated employer. But second, exchanges like this also help to define these characters in light of the other. When Bertie and Jeeves speak to each other, we see just how far apart they are in their thinking, but also how close their relationship is. After all, Jeeves, though he personally doesn't speak like Bertie, can understand him and provide the reader with a formalized version of what his employer says. 
Likewise, Bertie can do the same for Jeeves. Take, for instance, this passage from Jeeves in the Morning, where Jeeves explains to Bertie the reasons for why his Aunt Agatha wishes Bertie to deliver a gift in person to Florence Cray. I understand that the trinket is a present for Lady Florence, sir, who is celebrating her birthday today. Her ladyship wishes you to convey it to its destination personally, realizing that, should she entrust it to the ordinary channels, the gift will be delayed in its arrival beyond the essential date. You mean, if she posts it, it won't get there in time? Precisely, mm -hmm. sir. <laughs> Bertie essentially proves all the superfluous formal expressions out of Jeeves' speech and delivers it to the reader in the snappy style of his own dialect. As Coburn notes, Woodhouse, quote, never tired of variations of this low, high joke about language. The butler speaks better than the upper-class employer, and the employer has to dumb down his butler's speech to understand it. Thus, Woodhouse moves easily between these two languages in his novel, and these, of course, only re represent a small portion of the many types of speakers in his work. Woodhouse, Woodhouse can definitely move from the trumpeting, pushy voice of Aunt Dahlia declaring, isn't that young hound awake, Jeeves? To the countryfied language of Constable Oates, who protests that the door leaked at me in a virulent manner. I was zeroed from my verse. Woodhouse's abilities as a writer become obvious in his ability to create, sustain, and transition between the distinct voices of his novels. These distinct voices in some ways are the characters themselves, since Woodhouse's novels are primarily dialogue driven. When we encounter characters, we usually get a brief description of them by Bertie, but we primarily get to know them through their speech. Thus, language is one of the roots of Woodhouse's success as a humorous author, allowing him to create the big characters that shape his plot, as well as using the juxtaposition of voices to create a space for incongruity and thus humor to arrive. The use of dialogue and voices for humor in Woodhouse does not lie simply in the character's speech, for his novels include other types of languages that engage in the text. Woodhouse also allows his novels to work in conversation with outside texts through copious uses of illusions, as I mentioned before. Jeeves most often acts as the mouthpiece of these outside texts by supplementing Bertie's speech by supplying a particularly fitting quote or literary character that his employer can't remember. I've already referenced the Joy in the Morning Exchange, which is a classic example of this, but the novels contain many others. Not surprisingly, Shakespeare makes an, an appearance, such as later in Jeeves in the Morning, when Bertie makes a reference to a passage from Hamlet that Jeeves must complete for him. I shall shortly be telling Uncle Percy things about himself, which will do something to his knotted and combined locks, which at the moment has slipped my memory. Make his knotted and combined locks to part, and each particular hair to stand on end like those upon the incredible porpentine. Porpentine? Yes, sir. That can't be right. There isn't such a thing. However, let that pass. <laughs> this example also shows Woodhouse's ability to use dialogue between texts to, le to level hierarchies in literature. Shakespeare, one of the pillars of English literature, becomes an object of criticism for Bertie, who returns to the illusion a few pages later. You're sure it's porpentine? Yes, sir. Very odd. But I suppose half the time Shakespeare just shoved down anything that came into his head. <laughs> Thus, in Woodhouse's world, where anything is game for humor and high and low can switch places, Shakespeare becomes just another quirky author, not someone on a pencil. When the languages of other texts enter Woodhouse's world, they leave whatever high status of serious work they might have had and get the same treatment as the other elements in his novels, as fodder for humor. We see the same attitude in Woodhouse's autobiography, where he benevolently offers the tongue-in-cheek remark that, quote, Shakespeare's stuff is different from mine, but that is not necessarily to say that it is inferior. <laughs> <laughs> Literary hierarchies are leveled for the sake of humor. Thus, in addition to carefully constructing, constructing well-planned plots and lively characters, Woodhouse's craft extends to tying together voices of his novels with outside voices showing his knowledge of and situation within the larger body of English literature. The reverse of Woodhouse's remark regarding his work compared to Shakespeare actually very succinctly expresses the heart of my argument. Woodhouse's stuff is different from Shakespeare's, but that is not necessary to say that it is inferior. Woodhouse clearly shows his mastery of the English language and his ability to create characters that are just as personable as those of more serious texts. We continue to come back for more of Bertie Worcester and his companions, even though they may not have as many layers as Jane Eyre or Macbeth. While not addressing societal issues or using humor as a weapon to expose some kind of Arab behavior, 
Woodhouse still offers opportunities for the type of soul-shaping experiences that Edmondson advocates for. Through his willingness to use every situation as one for potential humor, Woodhouse invites his readers to put on the same humble spirit of fun his characters exhibit. Woodhouse may not be a Shakespeare, but he is still an exemplary author. Shakespeare here serves as a pinnacle representative of serious texts already taught in classrooms. Woodhouse does not accomplish the aims of Shakespeare's work as well as Shakespeare does, for he has different goals. But this difference should be equivalent to inadequate craft and less useful material in our minds. Humor simply asks a different kind of thinking from us. I'm reminded of an analogy brought up by one of the students, Elena, in the modern British literature class during our discussion of Comrade Dingo about the problem humor faces in academia. She likened studying humor very appropriately to the classic joke involving Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson. In the joke, Sherlock and Watson go camping, and several hours after falling asleep in their tent, Sherlock wakes up in the middle of the night, shakes Watson out of his sleep, and tells him to look at the sky, asking, what do you see, Watson? Watson replies that he sees thousands upon thousands of stars. And what does this tell you, Watson? Sherlock asks his companion. Wanting to show his friend his keen observation skills, Watson begins grandly. Astronomically, it tells me there are millions of galaxies and potentially billions of planets. Astrologically, it tells me that Saturn is in Leo. Theologically, it tells me that God is great and we are small and insignificant. Orologically, it tells me that it is about 3 a.m. Meteorolog meteorologically, it tells me that we will have a beautiful day tomorrow. What does it tell you, Holmes? Sherlock looks at his friend in disbelief and answers, Watson, you idiot. Someone has stolen our tent. <laughs> <laughs> Elena went on to say that sometimes we approach texts like Watson with the question of the stars, apply all types of schools of thoughts, theoretical approaches, and the real answer lies in the punchline. Humorous texts fittingly act like the punchline of the literature, providing a surprising encounter with a type of writing that doesn't quite fit into the molds of other canonical texts. Including Woodhouse in a course of study along with other texts not only gives students a chance for restorative laughter, but opens the door for new ways of thinking as well as an appreciation for humorous craftsmanship. Woodhouse and other humorous authors provide us with the opportunity to look at literature from a different perspective. It's a perspective that largely resists theoretical dissection and instead moves the reader toward an embodied response to the text. Humor by producing laughter, a physical response, connects the mind and body together in the reader in their experience of the text. Thus, the experience of humor is both an exercise of the mind and reminder of our physicality. Though it does it through a spoonful of sugar instead of pointing a finger, humorous writing, like serious texts, give us the chance to be reminded of who we are as humans, creatures of both body and